we're talking on this broadcast each day about the meaning of life and the real purpose of your being here at all. I don't know if you've sorted it out yourself, but it is a very important question to be able to answer. Why are you here? What is the purpose of your life? Why are you driving this car day after day? Why do you get up and eat breakfast every day? Why do you keep on going? What's the point of it all? And we've been discussing for some months now several explanations for our presence here on this earth at this time. And what we have been doing quite recently is to look at some of the experiences through which we all pass and find out if that explanation of reality contributes anything towards our understanding of these experiences. The experience in particular that we've been considering is the experience of the Jekyll and Hyde syndrome that most of us know so well. That is the experience of a different personality that expresses itself at inconvenient moments and utterly contradicts the personality that we think we have and that our friends and relatives have become accustomed to. In other words, it's that situation that you probably have found yourself in where you want to be understanding and loving to the person that you're going home to, but some little thing occurs that just sets you off. And before you know it, there is rising up within you an anger and an irritability that cannot be controlled. And the whole evening, instead of being a beautiful experience, ends up a disaster area. That's what we mean by the Jekyll and Hyde syndrome. It's the experience of the kindly, generous, loving Dr. Jekyll being suddenly overtaken by the hideous, violent, cruel Mr. Hyde that started as a personality within him. And what we've been sharing is that it's important to find out why that is so. And, of course, what we have said is that one of the reasons for the presence of those seeming opposite and contradictory personalities within your own life is that there is something within you that keeps trying to remind you of the way you were meant to live. And in fact, the way you were meant to live was a beautiful way. It, it was a way of relaxation and rest. And it's expressed very clearly by that man that lived in the first century when he talks about his father who made the world and who made you. And he says this, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O men of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For everybody seeks these things. And your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. And that's the way we were meant to live. We were. We were meant to live here on this earth and do what the Creator had fitted you to do and enjoy doing it and then trust Him. Now, if you say, oh, lie back and do nothing, no, of course not. No, the whole economy of the world was planned by the Creator on the basis of your doing what you're good at. 
whatever you're good at, whether you are good as a carpenter or good as a secretary or whether you're good at brushing floors or whether you're good at cleaning sinks, whatever you're good at, his plan was that you would exercise your abilities and fulfill yourself in doing those things. But his plan was that you would actually have a close personal trust in him and that he would by means of that, supply you with everything you needed, sometimes via your salary, sometimes through your wages, sometimes through gifts, sometimes through him uh, ca uh, con controlling your cash flow so that, uh, in fact, your liabilities did not exceed your assets, sometimes through controlling uh, your accounts receivable so that they didn't overwhelm your accounts payable or your accounts payable didn't overwhelm them. But... Whatever way he did it, he would provide for you, and you would be trusting him and depending upon him. And that was the way the Creator wanted you to operate. And there is something in you, especially in your conscience, that keeps making you move in that direction. And so there is in most of us something of our childlike trust in our parents that we had when we were young. And there is in most of us a kind of abandoned, enjoyable, exhilarating readiness to just trust ourselves to the wind. There is in all of us that exhilarating sense that when we look at a bird and see it soaring into the air, we feel we were made to soar. When we look at a little baby, one of our own little children, and see how absolutely trusting they are of us and how they're not all worried where their lunch is coming from or where their winter coat is coming from, we have a sense that there's something of that that is meant to be in us. And, of course, that's what old Wordsworth meant, you remember, in his ode on immortality uh, at Tintern Abbey, wasn't it? Uh, he wrote, uh, sh uh, Heaven lies about us in our infancy. Shades of the prison house begin to close around the growing boy. At length the man perceives it die away and fade into the light of common day. And he was saying that there is in us when we're children some of that bright and delightful trustfulness that you see in a little child of its own father. And that is a hearkening back to what we were intended to trust for our security. We were intended to trust not uh, even Margaret Thatcher and not the government, and not the economy, and not even the old lady of Threadneedle Street, not the Bank of England, or the Bank of America, not uh, Citibank, or Barclays Bank, nor were we meant to trust our inheritance, or our parents making the right kind of will, or our company, or our salary. We were meant to just trust the creator of the world who is the one that put us here via our mother's womb. And actually there's something in us that makes us want to do that and makes us not want to worry or not want to be anxious or not want to grab at other things or not want to covet or not want to fret or worry and try to manipulate all day how we will make another dollar or another pound. But there is the side of us that has been trained for generations to try to get our security by amassing enough money, enough possessions, enough property, enough stocks and shares, enough pension funds, enough homes, so enough children even, so that we will know we will be able to keep ourselves until we die and after that to keep our wives and our children. And so there is a part of us that depends constantly on things and puts its trust in things for its security. And that is the hide part of us that rises up and makes us covet and plan at night and worry at night how to make an extra dollar or make an extra pound. And that's where the hide comes from. The jekyll in us comes from that part of us through our conscience that reminds us of the way we were meant to live, that wants us to live depending on the creator of the world, the Hide part of us makes us want to depend on the world itself and on the things in it to get us our security. That's part of our explanation of Jekyll and Hyde in our life today. Let's talk a little more tomorrow about it.